So today we get to the good stuff. We've been in a series called What Happens When, where we've been applying the promises of God's word to our questions about death, dying, and everything that comes after. And we've learned a lot. Perhaps the biggest thing we've learned is that in the Christian faith, eternity is really thought of as something that happens in really three parts. There's dying, then there's resting, where we wait with Jesus, and then there is rising. And this last part, rising from the dead and the recreation of all things, this really is the best part. It's so incredible that an entire book of the Bible is dedicated to it, the book of Revelation. Paul, throughout the New Testament, he, he points to it. All three Christian creeds end with it. And it can be argued that one of the reasons Jesus was crucified is because he liked to talk about it. Eternity for Christians is something that happens in three parts. We die, and then we rest with Jesus, and then, then in the end, when Jesus returns, we rise and all things are recreated. And that rise from the grave and, and the recreation that comes with it, it is the best. It's the best for a number of reasons, which I want to touch on now. Um, first, it's the best because it shows us that God finishes what he starts. Uh, raise your hand if you know someone who is great at starting things, but horrible at finishing things. Keep that hand up if it's the person you're married to. Okay, you can put it down. Uh, we all know people who are great at getting going, but equally great at getting distracted. They leave piles of projects all over their life, and the second you attempt to clean up their unfinished business, their response is, hey, I was working on that. God is not one of those people. He finishes what he starts. And when God started this project that we find ourselves in, his intention was a world where human beings enjoyed an eternal life in a physical body, a never-ending physical existence in a creation that fully satisfied us and with a God who was so close that he walked among us. Now, long story short, Adam and Eve rejected that plan and that affected everything. And since then, sinful rebellion has become the inherited attitude of all human beings. And separation from God, death to the body and chaos in creation has been the punishment we've all endured. Now, thankfully, God the Father sent his son to forgive us through his death on the cross and to restore us to his family through belief and baptism. And most people tend to think that that's it. But if the story stops there, if the story stops with our salvation, the project is not complete. As long as there's still a chasm between us and the creator, as long as the earth is still a dangerous, chaotic place and death is still knocking on our doors, then God's plan is no more finished than a kitchen remodel with beautiful new countertops, but busted old cabinets. There's work left to do. And that's why the return of Christ is so important because when Christ returns and we rise from the dead and all things are made new, that's when it all gets finished. That's when eternity, as God intended it in the beginning, finally and fully gets going. So what will happen on that day? Well, I've already touched on it a couple times in this series, even, even yet this morning. But, but when Christ returns, the first thing that will happen is we will rise from the dead like Christ has risen from the dead. First and foremost, we will rise like him. Uh, here, here's how Paul puts it in the New Testament. He, he says this. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, now, the key word in Paul's writing is that word first fruits. Uh, the first century audience that, that Paul was originally writing to, they were an agrarian audience. They, they understood farming. They understood that when you're waiting for a big harvest, that the initial produce that appears, the first grapes on the vine, the first fruit in the tree, indicates the existence of a crop to come, as well as the nature and quality of that crop to come. So what Paul is saying is this, look, 
all of you understand farming. So, so let me put it like this. Jesus was the first fruit of a future harvest. Jesus was the first fruit of a resurrected and restored world. The fact that Jesus rose on Easter proves that we all will rise just like him at his return. Here's what this means. Jesus's once dead body came back to life. So at Jesus's return, your once dead body will come back to life. Jesus's resurrected body was glorified. Your body will be glorified. We will enjoy a life without even the most subtle hint of death and decay in our bones. The best thing I could compare it to is a, a six-year-old boy. Now, perhaps that's because I've got one at home. But you've been around little boys. They are seemingly indestructible. They roll out of bed at 6 a.m. They, they grab onto something they can call a sword and they jump on their bike, ride up and down the sidewalk with no shirt on for hours. They only hop off to down some nuggets and milk. And then they can go swimming the entire afternoon, get punched by their big sister, build a fort under the dining room table, refuse to eat anything for dinner. And though they're exhausted, only shut their eyes in bed on the threat of death. And then they wake up the next day at 6 a.m. and they do it all over again. Life in a glorified body is kind of like that, minus the, the swords and the shirtlessness and the chicken nuggets. It's hard for us to grasp because the life we live in the body is, is always, always feeling the sting of death. I've hit the stage in life where I can hurt myself by doing nothing. I will wake up with my shoulder killing me and Lisa will say, what did you do? I slept, that's what I did. I laid, I laid perfectly still for eight hours on a, on a scientifically engineered pile of comfort, and yet somehow my body was like, nope, we can't handle it. We are perishable. Yet God promises that one day we will live in these bodies, but we will experience no hint of death. Think about that. Imagine it if you can. A world where no one dies young. Where, where no child puts their parent in hospice, where, where not a single one of your white blood cells is being used at any moment to fight infection, where, where none of your muscles are keeping you from taking a walk with a loved one, where, where no pathway in your brain is ever clouded by dementia. The next time you see some little boy with endless energy running around, think to yourself, when Jesus comes back, I'll be more like that than this. Now, as if that wasn't enough, the other reason that the return of Christ and, and the, the resurrection from the dead and the recreation of all things is the best part of this whole story is because we will get to enjoy life with God in a renovated world. So, so resurrected, recreated bodies, that's good, but there's more. It'll be a life with God in a fully renovated reality. Listen to how John describes it in the book of Revelation. John was given a picture, a glimpse of this world, this reality to come. And listen to what he says. He says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is him referring to the church. We're the bride. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, that's a reference to Jesus, said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's Revelation 21. John is given this vision and he's talking in poetic language. And even though he's talking in poetic language, several things are clear to us from this section of scripture. First, at Jesus' return, the earth as we know it will be overhauled. Second, it will be home for us, God's resurrected, recreated family. 
And third, uh, the things that are reverberations of sin and death in this world, like pain and tears and war, they will not exist at all in that world. Uh, you, you've heard of Chip and Joanna, right? Yeah, Chip and Joanna are back. Uh, they've, they've got a new network. Uh, their show is back on. They're, they're transforming more houses. I'm waiting for them to run out of spots in Waco and eventually make their way down to Houston. Look at them. They're beautiful, right? They're like perfect in every way. Uh, Lisa is hoping that in the resurrected world, I look more like Chip and less like this. Here's my point for bringing them up. What Chip and Joanna do to houses is kind of like what God is going to do to this world when Christ returns. It will in so many ways be the same house. That's what Chip and Joanna do. They don't knock down the house. It's the same house, but it's, but it's brand new and it's better. When Christ returns, this, this renovated reality will be the same world in so many ways that we know it. It'll be the same house, but, but brand new and so much better with shiplap everywhere. Resurrected, recreated life will be really familiar, but also brand new. We'll have a physical body like we do now, but it'll be better. We'll live in creation like we do now, but it'll be better. God will be with us. He's with us now in word and sacrament and through his people. And yet it will be more and it will be better. Will we have jobs to do in that new world? I think so, yeah. Will we have relationships and interact with each other? Yes. Will there be pets in this world? Entertainment in this world? Will there be cars and food and beer in this new world? Why not? I mean, the potential for all those things existed before this world was corrupted by sin, so why wouldn't they exist after Christ has renovated and removed the effects of sin in the new world? So my answer to all those questions is yes, 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 and heck yes, but better. And, and, I'm, and I'm not just talking about a little better. John talks about the city that God's people will dwell in. He talks about streets and walls made of gold and the foundations for buildings carved out of precious stones and gates that are covered in real pearls. Now, again, John is using poetic language. He's not being literal. He's trying to describe the indescribable. He's trying to say to us, look, I've seen a glimpse of it, this, this recreated, renovated world. It's just better in every conceivable way. The beauty and the awesomeness that's so rare and valuable here will be commonplace there. Imagine a world where beauty and perfection is so common, they pave the streets with it. That's what it'll be like. Not only that, but it will be an unending celebration. So when Christ comes back, we are resurrected and remade, glorified bodies. Uh, the world is recreated, and it's a celebration. A celebration that never ends. Now, I've taught on this in the past, and this, the, the fact that it's an unending celebration is the part that most people tend to get hung up on. Uh, they get hung up on the fact that, that their minds can't wrap themselves around the idea of it just continuing to happen. Like uh, they say, won't we get tired of it? I mean, eternity is basically forever, right? Yes, it is. Most, think, most people think of eternity and their mind goes to a church service that never ends. A, a church service where, where the songs keep playing and the dude up front just keeps talking and the plate keeps getting passed over and over again. A church service where no one ever says amen and heads to Whataburger for lunch. Uh, again, in Revelation 19, John gets a glimpse of the moment where the resurrected church is presented to Jesus and, and, and he sees the renovated world and our eternal existence. And, and listen to how he describes it. Listen to, listen to what that eternal existence is like. John says this, Then I heard what seemed to be like a multitude a, uh, the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Here's the key. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. 
for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these words are the true words of God. When describing our entrance into eternity, John doesn't use church imagery. He uses party imagery. Actually, what he uses is wedding reception imagery. We are the bride covered in the forgiveness of Jesus, ready to celebrate our wedding, our brand new life in a brand new home. This will be something you want to attend. It won't be eternally boring. It will be an eternal party. That's what John's trying to say. I love what the angel says to John. He says, if you've got an invitation to this, you're blessed. Quick theological point. If an angel is jealous that you get to do something, it's probably going to be awesome. Look, we've all been to bad weddings, but have you ever been to a great one? Like a wedding that has a lights out reception? The kind of reception where the food is good and everywhere you look is someone you love who's looking good and everybody's dancing. Like even those who can't dance, who shouldn't dance are out there dancing, making a fool of themselves and nobody cares. Those kind of parties, those kind of parties are the best. They're the best because you're celebrating things that matter, love, relationships, and joy in the presence of people who matter. And when those two things come together, people who matter, celebrating the things that matter, but I mean, you've been there, time stops and it's just great. And that is what life in this resurrected, recreated world will be like. But there's more. Not only are we resurrected and recreated, not only is the world renovated, not only is it an eternal celebration, the likes of which you've never known, but best of all, we will bask in the fullness of the glory of God. The best part is the fact that God himself, the one who matters most, he will be in the center of it. God will be so close that, that you'll be able to get a, a tan from the brightness of his glory. He, he will be as tangible as the person who's sitting next to you right now. L listen to, again, to, to how John describes it. He says this, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb, that's Jesus, will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no, no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. You've seen the videos of, of soldiers coming home, right? Some sweet little girl is hanging out at school and, and out of nowhere, in walks dad, fresh from Afghanistan, wearing the fatigues, and he surprises her. And the second that girl sees her daddy, she hugs him like he might disappear in tears, out of nowhere, tears just flood down her face. And you can see in an instant how deeply that girl missed and needed her father. You and I were designed to be in the presence of God. You and I were designed to walk with our heavenly father. And though our rebellion has created a chasm between us, there is still this deep need to be close to him. It's a need that is met by, by Christ, who, who puts us back into the Father's family, but it's a need that will only be truly fulfilled when we are fully in his presence and we are able to embrace him. At that moment, even the joy of a child surprised by her soldier dad will be just a sliver, just a sliver of what we experience when we find ourselves in the unfiltered presence of God. Finally, that will be amazing. The presence of God in a resurrected body, in a recreated world, all things finally 
as they should be. There's no way that ever gets old. Not a chance. Let me leave you with this. Throughout the book of Revelation, John is told over and over again, these words are trustworthy. This, this vision you've been given is true. Write it down, share it with the world. And, and I think the reason that John is told that this vision is, is certain, that it's trustworthy, and that it needs to be shared with others is because God wants this, this picture of the new world to change how we live in this one. God wants the certainty that we have that this new world will arrive to influence how we live in this world. Uh, that's what Paul says in the New Testament. Uh, Paul says this, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. He's talking about uh, the, the resurrected, recreated world to come. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's referencing the return of Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus, knowing that this return and this recreated reality will happen, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This future is so certain for us that we should live as if we are already, that we are already members of it. And, and the truth is, if you're connected to Christ, then, then you are. You're not a citizen of this world. You are a future settler of the world to come at Christ's return. So let me ask you this. How would someone live who knew they belonged to a better world? Would you stockpile all the stuff of this world and live as if it's the most important thing ever? Probably not. Would you share most of your earthly things and invest more in eternal things? Because the eternal things are what are gonna, is what's going to last. Would you fear the powers of this fading world? Probably not. Or seek obedience to God who's guaranteed a better one? Probably so. But my guess is that you'd be able to endure more pain, put up with more struggle, because you know that, that all of it is leading to a life where bodies are strong and struggle is over. If you understood that you're a citizen of the world to come, you'd probably take more risks for God because you know that even if you lose your life here and following him, you will have a new one, a better one, lasting for eternity with him. Listen to me. How would you live if you knew that this was temporary and that God was guaranteeing something just as real yet infinitely better It is temporary. And he has guaranteed it. My prayer is, as we end this series is that all the things we've learned about dying and resting and rising in the end might change our living today. In Christ, there is nothing to fear about what happens next. Nothing. Go to the grave knowing that. and accept the invitation to live today as if you actually believe it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the promises you give to us about, about dying, about resting with Jesus, and, and about the return of Christ and the, and the restoration of all things, including our earthly bodies. We pray, Father, that this might give us peace, not just at the moment of our passing or at the moment we lose someone that we love, but, but it might give us peace today that shapes how we live today, that it might give us boldness today that shapes how we live today, that it might give us joy that shapes how we live today, knowing that the end isn't the end and that there is something better and infinite to come. Father, may the things we've learned about dying change our living. And we give you thanks that all these things are trustworthy and true because of what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for us. 
And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.